get water. Cookies. Grab some now. <clears throat> Get started in one minute. We'll give people another minute to come in. Yeah, we have some IT people here. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, there's actually really much, but I had to grade papers on those days. That's what we do. We write you up here. Hey. Hey, how you doing, Kevin? I'll just say before we get started, for my students, if you want your Crosby essays, I have them afterwards if you want. But I put the grades on Blackboard. If you want to wait till thir Wednesday, that's fine too. Hey, John, may I, may I just Yeah. Question yeah. Stephen sure. Pinker essays for students in my class. Make sure you hand them in before you leave. Okay. All right. Well, <clears throat> think we're good, Sharon? I think we are. We're good? Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> welcome to the John Tyler. <coughs> Excuse me. A week off, and it's hard to talk again. <laughs> welcome to the John Tyler History Forum. Um, it's sponsored by the history faculty here at uh, John Tyler, Sharon Burnham, uh, myself. My name is John Kern. I'm a professor of history here. Greg Hansard's at a, at a conference. Uh, we have other faculty here. Lauren Marshall's here, who gave a talk in November as part of the forum. There you go. Dr. Lauren Marshall. Um, <clears throat> so we welcome you. This is our third and final lecture of the year. And we really appreciate your presence here. This is a wonderful turnout. This is great. And make sure you get some cookies. Make sure you sign in on the sign-in sheets. There should be four or five of them going around. <laughs> Lauren has them there. Um, that way you can get credit if you need to get credit uh, for being here. But we, we appreciate your presence. I think it's, it's going to be a treat. Um, Dr. John Lemsa is here from VCU, and uh, he's going to talk about some new technologies that are changing the art of oral history interviews, and that's kind of exciting. Um, let me say a few words of, of introduction about John. Uh, I always like to know a little bit about the person who's going to speak. Uh, you know, historians, we love context, so let's put him in context a little bit. Um, he is a graduate of West Point, and he served for over 20 years in the U.S. Army Infantry. He spent seven years in Europe, uh, a year in Asia. Uh, his final deployment was at the Pentagon, so we thank you for your service in the armed forces. Um, after retiring from the military, uh, Dr. Lemza uh, went after, pursued his passion in history, and particularly the Cold War. You know, the Cold War was that period of ideological and political and economic and military uh, competition, rivalry between the democratic United States and the, uh, the communist Soviet Union. Uh, and it was fought throughout the world. I mean, it dominated world politics from the end of World War II in 1945 uh, down to the early 1990s. Um, and that's Dr. Lemza's specialty, is the Cold War. Uh, he received his master's from VCU in 2005. He received his PhD from George Mason University in 2014. He's already published his first book back in 2016. Uh, it was entitled American Military Communities in West Germany, Life in the Cold War Badlands. 1945 to 1990. He's working on a second book now, and it's about how the military, it's the history of the military on television uh, during the Cold War. Um, so interesting stuff. Uh, Dr. Lemza taught history here at John Tyler uh, from 2005 to 2009. He was again here uh, in 2015 and 2016. I always enjoyed talking with him uh, when we could do that. Uh, it was just a joy to have him here. Uh, he has taught since at VCU 
and he leads classes on post-1945 America. He leads classes on the Cold War, uh, on World War II, uh, the 1960s, and the topic of war and memory. You know, that's really interesting. How do Americans choose to remember their wars? Uh, and we see that it varies different, uh, greatly from war to war. But uh, he has also been on the teaching, I have to plug this now, he has also been on the teaching faculty of the Lifelong Learning Institute here in Midlothian uh, since 2005. And this is a volunteer organization of which John is president. And you probably are from, if you're a resident of Midlothian, you're familiar with the Lifelong Learning Institute because it's back there in the village behind um, Sycamore Square near the post office at the old Watkins Annex, the old, uh, I think it was an elementary school at one point, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they offer non-credit continuing education classes uh, to the community. Uh, and so if you're familiar with uh, you know, where the post office is, you've probably driven by their facility. Uh, but, but look them up on Google. They have, they have a lot to offer there. And I'm told that Dr. Lems's classes on the Cold War are standing room only. That's what I'm told. Um, so it's a real treat to have him here talking about his current research project uh, on the intersection of oral history and emerging technology. And so help me welcome Dr. John Limsa. Thanks, John. Um, it's great to be back here on campus. Thanks for that great intro. Um, I love coming back to John Tyler. I see a lot of friends, people that are familiar to me, and I've always enjoyed being here. And I can't believe how much the campus has grown. And you guys who haven't been here that very long at all, you're very lucky to see what the campus looks like now compared to what it used to look like just five or six years ago. Um, I want to thank John for that introduction, but I have to, as a historian, unpack things just a little bit with regards to the introduction. Um, he basically said that I went for my master's degree and then my doctorate after I graduated, but what really happened, it wasn't so much in, you know, pursuing my passion as it was my wife saying, well, you retired and you better not be hanging around the house. <laughs> so you better find something to do. And so, of course, then I went to VCU, and then I got my PhD, and now she's happy, so everything's good at home, <laughs> and I'm happy too, so that's great. Now, they might have put me in a little bit of a pickle here. Uh, you guys just finished um, spring break, didn't you? And it's also lunchtime, isn't it? So I want to thank you for doing that to me. Um, I hope I can be engaging enough to attract everybody's attention. Um, but I want to invite you also, as I go through my presentation, if you have information to contribute, and I offer this all the time when I lecture or teach at the Lifelong Learning Institute, very often there are people in the crowd who have a bit of information they'd like to share. So raise your hand as we go along. There may be something that you want to share with the rest of us, or you can hold it to the end. I'll make sure there's a little bit of time toward the end where we can uh, exchange, have a discussion, maybe answer some questions. Um, so, by way of beginning also, let me survey the class real quickly. Um, I like to ask always, when I do oral history presentations like this one, to ask how many of you are veterans? Do we have any veterans here? We have one veteran, two, the rest, not sure. Oh, yeah, Sharon, of course, you know, Dr. Burnham, uh, Professor Burnham is a veteran. So I want to thank you all for being here, and I hope that there's some element of the lecture that I'm presenting today that connects with you. And you can see some bit of one of your own memories in my presentation today. And then I want to thank you all for your service as well. Thanks, Sharon. Um, and the other thing I wanted to just check real quickly is, do I have any of my students from VCU here? OK. No takers for extra credit then. OK. Shame on them. They could have cashed in big time. OK. And then finally, I want to begin by surveying a last question, I promise. Um, is how many of you are oral historians? How many of you are oral historians? I see one, two hands, only two hands. Uh, how many of you have ever asked a grandparent, a friend, a relative, a father, sister, a brother to tell you some story, a war story, a story about the family life on the farm, something that they did when they were younger? How many of you? Okay, so, and whether you remembered it by writing it down, or you remembered it here, or you remembered it here, you are all oral historians. And so start with that today as a platform and talk about how we take that, that desire, that passion to remember what others have shared with us with regards to history and try to pass that along the way as we go. So um, I'm sorry, intersection of oral history and emerging technology. Ta-da, there we go. Okay, so a little bit of a roadmap. Here's what I want to talk about today. 
Um, of course, beyond the introduction, uh, talk a little bit about uh, oral history, benefits, uses, best practices, and I want to introduce that for those of you who are not familiar with best practices and the models of or oral history, and so we could see how this is forms a platform for me where I began my investigative work on oral history and moved forward with that, sort of forming that trajectory that took me through the intersection with technology. I want to talk about the integration of oral history um, to discover lost and new voices and create new narratives, and I'll talk a little bit about the desire to engage with emergence in technologies, intersection of oral history with innovation, and then a few of the outcomes that I've discovered. I move around a lot, so I know the guy with the camera is going to go crazy here. Okay, oral history. If we think about it, we have different ideas. A, a good definition that I've come up with is this. I've kind of crafted it from all of my experiences. Uh, the definition of oral history, the recording, preservation, interpretation of historical information based on personal experiences and opinions of the speaker, known as the narrator. Now, very often when we do work in oral history, we will talk to or kind of describe the person that we're interviewing as the narrator because they, in fact, are telling a story to us. They're sharing a story with us, so they're narrating a tale. Not so much an interviewer or an interviewee, but a narrator. So we'll call them that. And so that's what it's about. It includes, as you can see here, uh, written transcripts, voice recordings, and videos. Now, way back when, talk about the late 1800s, the coolest technology they had was a scribe or a secretary. So we begin with the earliest elements of technology at that time, sitting there, listening, and writing. Of course, prior to that time, we had oral tradition where people heard a story and passed it along. But there was danger in that, isn't there? There's always danger in passing a story along. It's like playing telephone. It's going to change. And so they said, well, why don't we just officially capture this? And they began writing things down. So over the years, technology came into the picture a little bit more. And they said, wow, now we can do things like voice recordings. That's really cool. So back in the 30s, they actually started to doing, do that sort of thing. And some of the earliest voice recordings they had ever done with oral history, uh, and this was cool technology at the time, was in the 1930s, the Works Progress Administration. How many of you studied the Great Depression? Sure, and the Works Progress Administration was put in place by the presidential administration, FDR. They gave them a lot of money, and they said, go forth and capture the slave narratives. How many of you have heard of the slave narratives? Good, more hands. Okay, more hands. And that's, that's located now in the Library of Congress. You can go there, visit Google, slave narratives, and they'll pop up. A lot of them are written. A lot of them are written down, but some of them are recorded. And the importance of capturing them capturing them on voice recordings in this technology at that time was that we could then hear the voices of those people who had actually been slaves, lived as their lives children in slavery. And that added a new dimension, if you could just imagine, the dimension from writing something down to hearing somebody tell that story. And you could hear the passion in their voice and the ebb and flow of emotion and so technology began to improve oral history from that moment forward as we move through the 30s into the 40s. So we emerge out of that time into the 50s, 60s, and then later into the 70s, and we can capture things on video as we're doing here today. So I'm going to become a piece of oral history here somewhere in an archive. But it was really even better because it, it provided us with more. It provided us with more than just listening and writing down. And so the other piece of this, and I'll get into greater detail with all of those as I describe it. We'll go through this some more. The other important piece that I'd like to remind my students when I teach oral history classes is having an accessible archive. It's very much one thing to capture it on paper or audio tape or even visually through a video recorder, but then what do you do with it? Where does it go? Where do you put it? You know, you can write it all down and it's going to end up in a, in a in a plastic bin somewhere in somebody's attic and 20 years from now you're going to open it up and find a yellow piece of paper that's crumbling but in those 20 years nobody read it but you captured it so you feel good about capturing but it's no good because it's not democratized it doesn't go out to the people nobody can read it and feel it and hear it and imagine it and so it's just locked away so you have to have an 
archive, some place to keep it, and it has to be accessible. And so we have some really great public archives, like the Library of Congress, that does the, uh, the Veterans History Project. How many of you might have been involved in that at some point? Okay, just a few. But that's a great project, and it's a very great archive. Now, archives aren't, aren't cheap, and I'll talk about that and how much that resource and that costs as we go along. Okay, so the benefits, all those rich benefits, some of which I've described in oral history brought to us through technology that's emerging, is it, that it adds texture, a human voice, a human voice to events. It adds that texture where you can feel the emotion, you can almost feel that person breathing life into that, that event that's being described, captured on audio or video. It, it's just amazing. Um, you can read about it in a textbook, like a history textbook you might have, but not until you actually touch a human life does it really bring it around to you. You can hear it, feel the heartbeat. And that's what the attraction and the passion for me is, feeling that life, bringing it into life for us. Uh, it may be useful to complement factual narratives, particularly if you're in a scholarly work of history, because it introduces facts, interpretations, and perspectives otherwise not apparent, particularly when we were looking at anyone looking at the slave narratives, there's a lot that comes out of that that's not very readily apparent by just reading a transcript or reading a description, a historian's description of what it might have been like to be a slave. It gives voice sometimes to individuals and groups who are marginalized, people who are pushed to the margins by society and culture who not normally have their lives captured. Oral historians go out and can record that in writing or even on video. And I've done some of that, and it's really a wonderful experience. I'll share that with you in a bit as well. Uh, it conveys feelings and emotions not captured by text. Talked about that a little bit, touched on it through audio and video dimensions. It creates a new narrative through collaboration. And very often when we begin to work in oral history, we don't realize that it's a collaborative product. And I stress that with my students. It's not a product that belongs primarily to the narrator, the person speaking. It's not a product that belongs solely to the person that's recording it. It belongs to both of you. It's a collaborative effort because you're creating something new and distinct. And that happens by the questions you ask, the interchange, the interaction you have with the person that's being interviewed, the narrator and the attitude and the situation and the environment you create. So you create something entirely new that's never existed before, and that's really exciting. And it provides an opportunity to engage with history. And this is what excites me, some other researchers, and also many of my students as well. It's an opportunity to roll up your sleeves and feel life, the heartbeat, and get your hands dirty just a little bit when you reach into history that way through oral history much more engaging and that's the attraction for a lot of us now there are limitations anything we do there are limitations and these are some of those that I've recorded over the last couple of years that I've been doing this some historians consider it to be too subjective to be credible and that's really really unfortunate uh, sometimes they say well it's just somebody's opinion of what happened at that time it's sort of like the old story that some of you might have heard about nine blind men touching an elephant and then they're each asked in turn to describe what it is they touched. And they each come up with a different perspective. Well, it, it feels coarse. And another guy says, well, it, it's a big long leg. And another guy felt the tail. And they each feel a different piece of the elephant, so they each describe it a separate way. And so some historians will say, well, it's nothing more than that. Other historians have been so bold and crude as to say it's nothing more than a bunch of old men drooling and dribbling about their past and we're just capturing it for no good reason except to make them feel good about who they were. And so there are historians out there that would feel this way, but there are those of us, many more of us, who feel the other way that it does add that texture that I've spoken about. Another limitation is it can be shaped by the questions, answers, and the setting. It, obviously, you know what a good question looks like versus a bad question. I could ask you a question, that's not very well constructed. That's nothing more than a yes or no answer. Were you afraid when you went to war? And if you get an answer that's just yes or no, then you pretty much have a worthless question, so you're going to have a, a worthless answer. Better question would be, and that we've learned to ask, is what made you afraid? 
How did you feel about a particular situation? Now, a lot of my work uh, will refer to the military and to war because I, I teach that class on war and memory. But it can be asked of anybody. I have uh, colleagues who are actually looking right now at uh, the tobacco industry and migrants who came into the state of Virginia, even as 14-year-old children, to harvest the tobacco leaves. And now they're discovering that those children um, and are having reactions because they've captured so much nicotine in their hands that it's having health effects on them. But it's the sort of thing that you don't hear about and you can't capture. So there's a thing that comes into it. So questions that we can derive and questions we can build sometimes limit us. It requires historical context. John mentioned context earlier when he was um, introducing me at the very beginning. But that's so important. You can have an individual, you can interview him or her and say, what happened at such and such a time? And they can describe what they did, whether it's a, a person that's a civilian or a person in the military. But if you don't understand what was going on around them, then it's very hard to extract the important points from their presentation, from their narration. So we have to make sure that we provide historical context. Uh, it, there are some resourcing costs. I say some resourcing co costs that should be with the a big R, this should be capitalized. There are more resourcing costs than there are resourcing availabilities when you do oral history. Uh, we struggle constantly to get grants to do this work. Part of it is because individuals don't believe it to be a credible source. Another part of it is because I work in a collaborative environment, interdepartmental, and some departments don't want to give you money if another department's not giving you money. We kind of hamstring ourselves that way. It's very difficult. And then there are the costs for things. I mentioned archives a moment ago, and sometimes we really have to rely on existing archives, like the Library of Congress. I tried to establish an archive for my work at VCU, and they told me that they could not begin to provide me with an archive in the library for less than $50,000. Does anybody have 50000 they can lend me? Okay, that's a whole lot of cookies. I'd have to sell a lot of John's cookies, make $50,000. And that's just to build the shell of an archive to capture my work. So a lot of my work goes to the Library of Congress because they're happy to get it. And it's more democratized that way, more people can see it. And then limitations of the narrator. Uh, unfortunately, some of the folks that we talk to are getting, getting older, very advanced in age. And some of them are limited by physical disabilities or physical challenges, I should say. We have individuals we try to interview that have had strokes because they're getting on in years and it's hard to hear what they're saying and, and sometimes it's hard to keep them with us for a long period of time. Um, most interviews, if you're doing a really good oral history interview, could go four hours. It goes four hours, you take breaks along the way and then come back and maybe do another hour or two for follow-on questions. When I'm working with 93-year-old pilots from World War II, 30 minutes is max. 30 minutes, after 30 minutes, they need to lay down. And it's no fault of their own. So we have to always take that into account. Um, so that's a challenge. And then other challenges that I work with my students on is that talk about limitations in the narrator. Sometimes they forget. They forget and we have to use prompts to remind them physical prompts, pictures, awards, flags, that sort of thing. And then it sparks a memory. And that's okay if they forget for a little while. But that's just kind of what we go through and some of the limitations we face. And so as I go through all this, the benefits and the limitations and, uh, and the best practices and the things that we do, think in terms of how technology can help improve all this as we go along. And you've already seen, I hope, um, how we've, when we've moved from physically writing something down to capturing it on an audio tape and in a videotape, each step along the technological path improves things for us. And we'll get to even better before we're finished here. So a little bit of an introduction to my coursework, thinking about what I've already described to you. My war and memory class is where I work out of. And um, I gather my students in there, and uh, we talk about war and memory. As John mentioned uh, at the very beginning, what I'd like to do is uh, we begin the class for the first half of the semester talking about how we commemorate and we, how we memorialize Americans and our interaction in war, and how very much 
We are a militarized society. We began in war and we can almost mark chronologically our societal growth and our history from one war to the next. And we're lucky that we still have so many veterans left with us, although they're disappearing at a, at a very rapid rate. So my class talks about that. It talks about how we decided how to build and what we were going to do with the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the Korean War Memorial, and others, and what it meant to be an American, how it helps us identify with who we are. That's what the class is about. So inside of that, inside of that box, what I've done is created part of this project where in lieu of a traditional semester project, students conduct oral history interviews of veterans. So instead of writing a traditional 20-page paper, 25-page paper, they're responsible for sitting down and putting together, after we talk about how to do it, putting together an oral history interview with a veteran, a real quality product that we then send to the Library of Congress. Um, I have about 75% support from my colleagues for doing that. The other 25% still think the answer for history is a, a dusty 25-page paper that very few people will read. And I am sure that I've stepped on a lot of toes by saying I think history needs to be more engaging and we need to interact with our history more, not shape our history so much as extract from our history those things that we can't normally extract if I'm doing traditional research. Doesn't mean we don't do research, doesn't mean we don't apply best practices as historians with the skill set that we have. It just means we take a different approach. So we look at and we talk to veterans of uh, Korea, Vietnam, and the GWAT. Everybody know what the GWAT is? Veterans? Remember what the Global Wars on Terrorism. Okay, so we actually talk to those veterans as well. If some of you in here are veterans, we can include you. Uh, here's my happy uh, crew that I started out with, my students. Some of them, as you can see, are a little bit older. Some of them are younger. This is in a place called The Workshop. The Workshop is in the basement of the library at uh, VCU. <clears throat> it's a great place. All the equipment is there free for use uh, for the students. It's fantastic. We have um, high-tech equipment like these cameras. We have audio recording equipment. There's actually a studio that's about half the size of this room uh, with a, a green and black screen behind it so you can put the backdrop you want behind that. We do some of our interviews there. If we can't interview in that studio, then we take the equipment out and we're able to bring it to the place where the veteran is. So that's some of my crew there. Um, three characters. This is not from a police lineup. And these are actually three of the veterans who also happen to have been my students. And this is really cool. I like this part of the class. These, these three guys, about a year ago when I was teaching the class, my war and memory class, they came in <clears throat> and they were excited to be there. But what occurred to me was that we didn't always have to step outside through the door to find the veterans. Sometimes the veterans were in the classroom. These are three of my students who were also veterans of the Global Wars on Terrorism. So we actually conducted interviews with them, which was exciting. It's exciting for them to be able to tell their story and get it officially put in the archive at the Library of Congress. And it was exciting for their fellow students who suddenly turned around and saw a face that looked just like theirs and said, wow, you're a veteran? That's really cool. I never knew that about you. Because, of course, when you see the pictures they shared with us with the crew cuts and, you know, the clean-shaved faces, they look entirely different. But now there are students. They're sitting in the classroom right next to a fellow student. Now they may be two years, three years older, but it's hard to tell with the demographics that I have at VCU. And so it, it was really neat to see how the students reacted to the fact 100% support from fellow students. It was a wonderful thing to see. And they got to interview other fellow students, so that made it even more exciting for them. And exciting for me, because I felt like I was helping them really connect with contemporary history, history that was part of their lives, my students' lives. Uh, here I am um, interviewing in the workshop, so that's what the studio looks like inside, uh, and using the cameras, the recording, information to capture the story, the narrated story, of a Vietnam veteran who was in special forces, 
traditional oral history type of interview, crafted the questions. Um, some things on here, uh, of course I blacked out his name, I won't reveal anyone's name for their own privacy, um, but I asked him to bring things with them. Sometimes they bring pictures, sometimes they bring these shadow boxes with medals in it. It helps them remember. And sometimes through the process, I might turn to the shadow box and I say, well, what is this medal for? I don't recognize that medal. And it begins another conversation, another train of thought that helps them connect with something that they did. Now, I mentioned this one individual. I have him here for a reason that will become apparent. But it was a traditional oral history interview. There are things that he shared with me as Special Forces officer in Vietnam at the time. And then there were things that he chose not to share. And so be aware of that. Best practices tell us that sometimes people just don't want to share. And you don't push them. And you tell them it's OK. It's OK that you don't want to answer that question if it makes you uncomfortable. And so that is an unwritten contract that you have with them. So always remember that. If you interview anyone, you talk to a grandparent, a friend, a veteran, remember they have that right to not answer your question. And then you also forgive them if you ask them a question and they go on a little bit too long because they love to do that also. And we love to get it. So great interview with the Vietnam veteran. This is um, an example where I had to take equipment outside of the workshop studio and we had to travel. 93, 94-year-old bomber pilot who flew raids over Germany during World War II. And then when the war was over in Germany, they sent him to the Pacific and he's flying bombing raids over Japan during World War II. He felt cheated. I just finished one war. You're sending me to another war. That was part of his narrative. Kind of humorous guy. Uh, he's no longer with us. Um, God bless him, he's moved on, of course. But uh, he was a, a wonderful and engaging narrator for us. Now, I do have to point out, you see, in both cases, wearing blue shirt and khaki pants, that is not the uniform of an oral historian, okay? Just, just to be sure. But it, I, th I did think that was an appropriate outfit, so I wore it twice. I'm a little embarrassed by that. Um, another great interview I did very early on uh, with this colonel. Great guy, lived down in the Petersburg area, uh, well into his 90s, was one of the last remaining Tuskegee Airmen. It was a wonderful, wonderful interview. Um, and a great veteran, three wars. One wasn't enough. World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Flew with the Tuskegee Airmen during uh, World War II and then decided he just wanted to be an infantryman. He had enough flying for some reason. And then the other two wars, he was a ground pounder like I was. Um, a great, entertaining, engaging speaker. Uh, a war, you can see it was during Christmas time. He had his flag back here, flags in the tree, uh, Christmas tree and all. Uh, a word about understanding technology. It was one of my first times out trying to do this. It was more than a year ago, maybe closer to two years ago, <laughs> was we had our sensitive equipment out there, our audio recording equipment, because we're in his house, which is, looked like a mini museum, by the way. So it was a lot to talk about. I uh, had our audio equipment out there, video equipment out there. We're all set to go. My little team of students and myself, we thought we were sharp. Um, so we get through the first 10 minutes of the interview, and he said, I needed to take a break, and why don't we check what we've recorded already? You know, we forgot to turn everything on. So the first 10 minutes, we said, uh, oh, Colonel so-and-so, gosh, I'm sorry, can we say that again? Great guy. Sure, no problem. Very... Very engaging, gracious individual. So we did it. He had to do the first 10 minutes over again. But it was OK, because he remembered something he forgot to tell us. So it was benefit to everybody. Second time we went through, great audio equipment, so good that we could hear his wife talking on the telephone to her girlfriend behind us. <laughs> Just too good, if you will. And these people are always so gracious. It, one of the great things of engaging, I talk about engaging with history, is when you go to their houses to talk to them, they do things. We go to this guy's house, and his wife's offering us coffee and cake. Would you like some coffee and cake? Uh, no, ma'am, thank you very much. We're halfway through the interview. She comes in with a tray with coffee and cake. No, thank you. And then you could hear her in the background, you sure you don't want more coffee and cake? No, thank you. And he's saying, Get out of here, get out of here. So, you know, some dynamics you have to deal with. But it, it's wonderful because you're dealing with human beings. When you talk about history, it's exciting. I, I love it. I, I really do. And he gave me his book, of course. Great guy. Okay, finally, 
technology continues to improve and and I captured the uh, the idea that we could be doing more with this but then I saw that the uh, there was more out there for us and I wanted to pursue that so the veterans kinetic imaging uh, project as I see here grew from a desire to engage even further with emerging technology and the way we were conducting the oral history narrative but it began or it was a spin-off from an ongoing project in the kinetics imaging department at the VCU School of the Arts. There's a professor there whose name is Semi Ryu. Some of you may know her. She's been on TED Talks before. Um, and so we contacted her, I contacted her with several of my students and said, we really want to use what you have and we can modify it and adapt it and bring it into what we're doing in oral history. And she's so excited about that. She said, sure. So before we knew it, we had an interdepartmental initiative on our hands between the history department, myself, the kinetic imaging department, Semi Ryu, and then the occupational therapy department because they got into the act. They treat veterans with PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder from the war and they said this would be a fantastic thing that we could use to treat our veterans as well. So the three of us came together and we said let's see if, how far we can go with this and so that's what this was about, the Kinetic Imaging Project for Oral History and, the, and there are the three of us. I'm the good-looking one on the left. <laughs> and so it was inspired also my passion for oral history but then my understanding of how we can go even further through technology uh, was inspired by things such as StoryCorps. How many of you may be familiar with one or two, three, four? Okay, great. More than I suspected. StoryCorps, oral history. They travel around the country. They give you an opportunity to interview family members for family stories. <clears throat> but even neater is that they will render your oral history interview into characters. They have the ability to make characters. They look like cartoon characters. So you have cartoon characters telling the story that and answering the questions that you may ask more engaging that way for some people so that's a little bit about StoryCorps but that's what Semi Ryu was doing she was working with puppets to tell life stories then she kind of merged in with kinetic imaging software that was available at the time so it actually what we did capitalized on existing software that she was using and was out there to capture the life stories of nursing home residents and that's how it began. She was capturing their life stories and I said, wow, right, shocking blaze of the, uh, the obvious here, we can do this with our veterans too because we already have those models and practices down. So what it's all about is using interactive avatars, avatars just like the movie. You create a character of somebody and we created characters of the veterans and use those characters to tell their stories. It's called Voicing Elder, and this is the link to it. We won't go there now. We have uh, a few more things we want to cover, but that's what it was about. Voicing Elder is an interactive technology. Uh, Professor Semi Ryu connected with someone she knew was working through this, Stefano Farali at the University of Mannheim. He developed the software. It's gone through several iterations since that time, but it includes things like lip sync technology, sentiment analysis, algorithms. I am not, I don't write code, so I can't tell you how this works, except you put a microphone in front of somebody and it's magic, um, as long as it's plugged in. Um, it detects emotional content from live speech, so it can tell when somebody's being stressed or somebody's happy, and it provides a background to match so you can see the emotion that's being fe felt at that time. For example, happy feelings, the background will be uh, sunny and bright, sad or angry feelings, then there are thunderstorms and darkness or clouds behind it. So you can actually see the character uh, projecting to you, telling the story, and behind them the change of the scenery based on the emotion. Uh, this is a little bit of what it looks like. Here she is working with one of the residents of a nursing home. You can see how that person is being projected on the screen as an avatar. Right now she's helping them practice before they tell their story. Um, and here she is with one of the veterans that I brought in. And if you don't recognize him, maybe hard. This is the veteran, the uh, Vietnam veteran. 
who was in Special Forces, the guy that I had interviewed in a traditional interview using the video, I brought him back on a different day and I said, would you mind being part of the process? Would you mind us using you as a guinea pig? Of course, you know, shock. Well, am I going to be hooked up to electrodes? What's going to happen to me? Is it going to be painful? No, 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 no. None of that. None of that. So we took him through the process. And here she is training him on what's going to happen before we actually conducted the interview. And you could see what he would look like, his character would look like. And yes, we need more money to refine that character. So anybody wants to put money in the bucket as you leave the door, that's fine with me. We got to make these characters a little bit more realistic looking. We're still basically in the beta phase there. And what really bothered uh, Mark, my veteran, was that when we project an, an older character, an older avatar, they're always bald. And Mark wasn't bald. And he was really, can't you get a better advertiser for me? They're all bald. No. So, you know, we've got some work to do there. We're working on it, though, all right? And so here he is. He's trying to, we're trying to get him in sync with hand motions and with the character up there. And we eventually did. It, it was very, uh, it went very well. So the benefits realized as we migrated through using this interactive software and we could project the avatar were these. That avatar, the character, provided a freedom of expression, particularly masking physical challenges. And you may not know this, but our veteran that I used, my friend Mark, uh, has to use a walker. He's had a stroke. He has a very difficult time getting around and moving. But when he's the avatar up there, he's 20 years old again. He's up there, he's moving because the avatar allows him to do that. So he can move beyond physical disability. And so now you can see that connectivity with the occupational therapy guys who say, well, if there's a veteran who has challenges, physical or mental challenges, this frees them. This frees them here. It even masks their identity. We don't have to project their name up there. It could be almost anybody. So it, it did that for them. And, and so the anonymity also encouraged greater engagement. The narrator, meaning the guy or the lady telling the story, shared details of stories not disclosed earlier. Important, because I wanted to share back with you something that our veteran didn't tell us during the traditional oral history interview when he was on camera that he told us when he was an avatar. And it was an unfortunate story about how one of his friends was captured during the war by the Viet Cong and was tortured to death. And they did that by dismembering him. And Mark was not able to tell us that during the traditional oral history because he kept breaking down. But when he was able to be an avatar, he told the story more freely. He was able to tell the story because he wasn't on the camera. And so you get more from the story. And it, he was comfortable with me telling that to other people later when I asked him if I could share that. He said, fine, no problem. And so maintain the benefits of existing oral, oral history models, the way we do things, but it embellished it in a better way. So the outcomes, we discovered a new methodology for oral history. Continued success is dependent on the development of the existing software. Future progress is depending on av availability of resourcing. I have to say this again. I, I feel like I'm in, uh, in church. Give me money, right? I give me money and I can make it better. So I, I just want to, yeah, I want to take a break there because I do want to share the video that we put together. Uh, this is a video that we put together to sell the project around. We've gone to conference or two and tried to explain to people what it is we're doing. And so it's just a very short video that was put together by students. So I think that's important as well, students continuing to engage. I hope you can hear that. in which I participated with Professor Simi Ryu of the Fine Arts Department and Tony Gentry, Dr. Tony Gentry of the Occupational Therapy Department. This collaboration took us to the intersection of technology and oral history. 
There we coupled the use of the voicing elder kinetic imaging software with an oral history interview. Our goal was to enhance the interview process by affording the narrator a new form of expression through the creation of a mirrored avatar in order to add more texture to his presentation and to elicit more emotion. Participating in the project at the time was a veteran of the American military conflict in Vietnam. We had great success with this project and we hope to continue more interviews in the future. So it has the lip sync technology and you can see how the background changes based on the emotions of the narrator. Uh, the students who put it together I have to give them their, their due credit right there. Um, and the music does not come with the software. I don't know where they got that from. Um, so we had a lot of fun doing that, and I think it, uh, it, it made a big difference and will continue to make a big difference in what we're doing. Now, things don't slow down. This is a moving train. Uh, the last piece I added on just very recently here is about expanding digital horizons even more. Uh, folks on the West Coast have taken it another step. It's called New Dimensions in Testimony is the project that they have. It preserves Holocaust survivors' stories as holograms. Uh, it's produced by the Shoah Foundation at USC in conjunction with USC's Institute for Creative Technologies. Uh, brings together intergenerational storytelling. As I said, it's still very much in the beta or developmental stage, but they hope to eventually include complete 3D avatars where we're creating characters. They've gone a further step and they have interact, uh, interaction they've established with uh, individuals. So they have an individual here. I'll show you a brief clip on it in a moment. Uh, captured uh, three-dimensionally by all these cameras and they've got a super type of software that allows you to talk to that individual even after the image has been captured based on archived answers the individual already has. So I'll show the, share this with you very quickly. It's really super and um, I wish I was there. goes and searches in the database of video clips which have been turned into text themselves 
um, and brings back the most appropriate video clip to answer the question that you're asking. Each survivor was interviewed for five days and asked about a thousand questions, recorded by a sphere of cameras that captured every single angle, sound, and emotion. Back to the Superman part. If you're wondering whether maybe you'll be able to someday speak to loved ones who have passed on in this way, Show Foundation says, yeah. An offshoot of the Institute called Story File was created pretty much to do exactly that. And to answer your last question, yes, developers say they have future-proofed this and captured the subjects in full 360 so that eventually when the technology catches up. Okay, so the technology is catching up, and we're going to get there really soon. Makes me jealous for our project, but if you have Steven Spielberg backing you, you know, you have all the resourcing you could possibly need. Uh, but uh, even though what we're doing kind of pales in comparison, it's uh, actually maximizing the availability of resourcing that we do have at our fingertips. And so that brings me to the part of the presentation where I say, do you have any questions or comments? How many of you want to be interviewed? Nothing. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks, guys. Thank you very much. That's it. Um, StoryCorps especially. Google.